This is episode number five with Jamie Alderton. Welcome to the Grow Podcast with myself, David O'Connor, where my goal is to interview world-class guests so you can constantly progress as a person in terms of your training, your mindset, and nutrition. So without further ado, let's dive in. How are we keeping guys and a big welcome back to the Grow Podcast and today I have ex-British army officer, natural bodybuilding champion, podcast host and author of his recently released Mindset with Muscle book and the podcast as well and Grenade Fit owner Jamie Alderton and with Jamie's background, his podcast, his book and his recent facility being opened, today I wanted to dive into his head to, to kind of take out the mindset hacks, tips, routines, habits that Jamie has utilized over the last number of years to get where he is today. So with that, we're focusing on Jamie's habits, routines, and lessons, main lessons from the Army. He talks about the fixed versus growth mindset and gaining momentum, why the 80% mentality will, will end up probably producing more results than being 100% all the time, Jamie's methods of process versus outcome goals and how you can focus more on the processes to bring those outcomes that you want, how Jamie eats peanut M&Ms daily and stays in incredible shape year-round, and amongst a lot of other things and lessons, there's getting your brain to focus more on what you want. Because that's kind of really what we wanted to get away from this podcast too. But before we dive in, I wasn't going to bother saying this, but I said I felt I kind of have to. During the recording of this podcast, I was in incredible nerve pain. I was on painkillers all day. So just in my questions, I felt that I didn't sound as enthusiastic as I should have. So just excuse me for that, please. Um, but look, let's dive into the podcast and hopefully you get some nice takeaways from it. So, Jamie, welcome to the podcast. David, thank you ever so much for inviting me. No problem, my man, no problem. And, um, Jamie, I just like to always start off these chats just around creating a bit of context for what lies ahead for the listeners. And I suppose there's no better place to start with. Were you always, were you always in the fitness industry and how did you get to, yeah, how did you get to where you are, really, if we can backtrack a small bit? Well, it, I think it all started really when I left the army. I left the army December 2009 and I kind of looked at the military as a stepping stone onto something else, but I never looked at it as a kind of a long-term career. And I left December 2009 and I'd lost a bit of focus because the army is very much, you know, it works out in sort of six month rotations where you're getting ready to deploy on operations, you deploy on operations and you spend about six months doing regimental duties. And the problem that I had now is I had no one on my shoulder shouting at me, telling me what to do. And I most certainly didn't have that kind of six month rotational plan anymore. So I started training at the gym and one of the uh, bodybuilders there had a look at me and said, oh, you're in pretty good shape and told me I should do one of these bodybuilding shows. Now, it didn't really appeal to me standing in front of a thousand people in a pair of Speedos. Um, however, I was like, yep, yeah, let's go for it. And it, you know, it was kind of exactly what I needed, you know, that kind of routine and rituals. And I focused on that. So I, did, I think it was about 13 weeks. Uh, this was 2010. I came second in that show, qualified for the British final. And I did another competition in, I believe it was October, November 2010. And I became British natural bodybuilding champion. So I kind of got to grips quite quickly with the whole competing nutrition training malarkey and really really started enjoying it and having it as a kind of a fundamental part of my life now as i went on from 2010 i was working abroad in uh, kenya somalia and the middle east i was uh, actually uh, utilizing a lot of my security clearance so a lot of different stuff over there and you know as, as fantastic as it was it wasn't my calling in life you know it wasn't something that I felt you know I'd tick the box so to speak and the best thing ever happened to me in 2012 and that was I got made redundant from that job and it was at that time where you know I'd been in the fitness industry since 2010 since I started competing but I hadn't you know gone down the path of it being a career for myself and a lot of the reasons for that was that I looked at it as a hobby rather than a career and I was a bit worried that if I turned my kind of hobby and hobby and passion into a career that I'd end up resenting it. Um, it was quite a stupid thing for me to to do, actually, because if you you know, if you're immensely passionate about something, you put a lot more effort into it and naturally become more successful. So when I got made redundant in 2012, I decided to go down the whole PT route. You know, I had zero money because I would just bought a brand new house. 
However, I did have a credit card. Um, I whacked about £16,000 on my credit card, which included all my gym facility equipment, um, you know, the PT course. And I got to work. You know, I started hustling, started working. And, you know, within four years, I had an immense amount of success with clients, uh, transformed thousands of physiques and, you know, closed down that studio and opened up my grenade fit gym facility. And uh, that sort of takes me up to today. If we're trying to fast forward sort of half a decade's worth of uh, progress. Yeah, because I think I kind of came on scene of following you, I think it was, must be two, two and a half, three years ago at this stage. And I kind of, I seen the journey from more of like your online coaching side of things into Grenade Fit. So it was nice to see that transition, like, and then obviously the podcast and the book came out as well. Um, and like I've always said to people that have even, over the last week I was saying, I have Jamie coming on the podcast and they were saying, all physique related stuff you know the questions they wanted to ask and i was like people don't realize how powerful this guy is when it comes to like his perspective on things his outlook on things and just the whole mindset side of it because throughout that um jamie you probably learned you probably picked up a lot of stuff from the army that i'm guessing and um it was actually a question i was going to pop into later on the podcast but just kind of the fact that we started off with it i suppose just to kick things off first like what what would be if you could pinpoint a few of them what would be your main lessons from the army in terms of maybe, I don't know, perspective or mindset or just kind of going after what you want really, I suppose? I think the biggest difference, and, you know, I've asked myself this question a lot. I mean, I was very fortunate to have those habits and routines drilled into me, you know, with regards to physical fitness, with regards to robustness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the biggest thing that I see in the military, which I don't see as as much you know in uh, everyday life is a lot of it's i would say it's the blame game and um, what i mean by that is you know when i was on operational tour when i was working in the army you're you go on a lot of exercises and operations and you're extremely tired you know you're extremely drained and you're expected to perform at your best now What's very easy to do is it's very easy to, you know, chuck your teddy out, so to speak, and, and blame everybody else. Oh, this isn't my responsibility. This isn't what, you know, what I need to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's very easy to get into that mindset of blame because as soon as you blame somebody else, it's not your responsibility and you give up hope. When you're in the military and you look around and you're tired and you're hungry and you're, you know, drained and you look around and everyone's like that. You just get on with it because everyone's in the same boat as you. And what I found with a lot of people outside of the military is when the going gets tough, they give in too easily. And a lot of it is their environment around them and, you know, what they've expected of themselves. Now, a lot of people can get triggered by that because people go, oh, well, you know, this, that and the other. You don't understand my problems, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of it's just perspective. You know, I have a lot of people come to me and go, Jamie, you don't understand. This has happened to me. This has happened to me. This has happened to me. And I'm, you know, a lot of the time I say, well, I don't understand because I've never been through it. But if I was to have found someone who's been through the same yet not use the same excuse as you, would you still be using that excuse? And the answer is no. But what I say to people is that you've got to understand there is billions of people on this planet with worse problems than you that probably aren't whinging as much as you get over yourself and you know it's a bit of a harsh reality but it comes back to reflecting on yourself it comes back to that self-awareness it comes back to you just thinking about your own you know strengths as well as weaknesses you know are you blaming other people for your misfortune or are you just making excuses and I'm not just talking from a body, you know, body composition pr perspective here. I'm talking from a business and life perspective too. Because one of the biggest kind of wake up calls for me is I was very good at getting myself in shape, very good at habits and routines and consistency when it came to, you know, bodybuilding, body composition. But what I learned to realize, you know, sort of 2013, I'd say, is that it's all the mindset kind of thing. And you can adapt that kind of mentality to anything. You know, writing things down, structuring a plan, looking at where you are, and most importantly, being honest with yourself, because that is the biggest downfall of a lot of people, 
they genuinely aren't honest with themselves of where they currently are because it's very, very painful to accept that you're not doing something because as soon as you accept that there's a problem there, it means that you have to do something about it. But if you don't accept it as a problem, you don't get any stress or tension from doing it because you don't believe that there is something that needs to be resolved. And that's something that I kind of get people to realize a lot. And obviously that's something I've realized a lot about myself. You know, I'm very self-aware of what I do. I do write a lot of things down. I do highlight my own weaknesses as I do my strengths and I work to improve and better them, uh, you know, and better them. And this is something that a lot of people don't do. And it's something kind of that was ingrained to me in the military of just getting on and doing the job until it's done which is, you know, I can't expect every single person to go and do military service to understand that. But it doesn't mean that you need to join the army to understand, you know, that is a lot of people's downfalls, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think as, as well, what you're kind of getting at is like you were exposed to that earlier on and you knew how different it made things in your life. You knew how better things were. You knew how better things were when you're more self-aware, I suppose, in general. And I think that's why as well, I obviously I haven't been in the military or anything like that but for myself when I start doing this stuff like I do a lot of what you just said there as well Jamie like writing things down being a bit more self-aware with things and I can see the knock-on effects from that not just with the health and fitness stuff I think for me and you we both own facilities gym facilities as well so we kind of were nearly forced to learn stuff with this too and sometimes because you can deal with more stuff and business and life and whatnot but um, I think a lot of that too from my perspective is just and like you've already said, people just don't know how much better things can be when you have these habits, routines, and when you are more self-aware in place. So they just kind of go off the deep end with things, don't they? Definitely. And I think as well, it's just this abundance of information um, these days. You know, the, the thing is, is that people talk and say the same things day after day after day. And people say to me a lot of the time, yeah, I know that. And that's, I think that's the worst thing that I hear from a lot of people. Yeah, I know that. Because one of the best quotes that I've heard from Robin Sharma is, knowing and not doing is the same as not knowing. Just because you're aware of something and you know it doesn't mean that you apply it. And I think this is the biggest problem with a lot of people in their lives. Most people know what they need to do. They're just not doing it. And in actual fact, it is as easy as just assuming full responsibility for your actions and creating a plan of action to go and change that. Yeah, that that leads you directly into the next question too, I suppose, with um yeah, why like if you were to put maybe one or two points on it, Jamie, why do people fail when it comes to getting in shape, when it comes to uh, it's we've probably already touched on it a bit like but yeah, it's it's probably just saying they're not self aware, the blame game. Um is there anything else to add to there like like why do people fail in general, I suppose? There's a great book by Carol Dweck called Mindset and what she sort of says in there is she goes down to explain the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset and some of the biggest lessons to learn from there is understand that there's nothing wrong with failing and making mistakes and I think so many people are worried about making a mistake you know, saying that they're going to do something and not doing it and looking like a bit of an idiot in front of their friends, that that itself prevents them from doing it. When in actual fact, you don't actually learn how to do something better until you've made, made many, many mistakes, until you've learned what not to do. And then until you've failed at a lot of things, then you learn how to succeed. Um, a perspective that I try and get a lot of people to look at is that you always need momentum in your life. Whenever you get depressed, whenever you get into a bit of a funk, it's because you've stood still. A great analogy by um, Dr. Maxwell Maltz in one of my favorite books, um, Psycho, -Cyberme uh, Psycho Cybernetics, talks about people's lives like a bike. Uh, it sounds a little bit strange, but... If a bike is stationary, it's very hard to balance and it's very wobbly. However, when you move and obviously pedal a bike, it's easier to balance. And that's a lot like um, a lot like life. You know, you need momentum in your life. That momentum gives you motivation and you head towards 
the path of success. But what you've got to understand is that sometimes you go down the wrong path and that's okay. The only time where that becomes a problem is if you stand still. And obviously that's people's perception of failure. They've failed, they've stopped, that's it. It's not, I've failed, okay, I'm going to turn around, I'm going to continue my momentum and try and find a way not to fail. And I think that is the biggest problem with people in failure. They give up before they've even had the opportunity to try. I think, would you say, Jamie, that's a lot to do with perspective shifts as well? Like, it's one thing that I've learned for myself over the last couple of years is that, that as well. I don't know if you've heard of Ryan Holiday, his books. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Really, like, Ryan has two brilliant books. Um, well, he's more than two, but two of them that I've read recently are Obstacle is the Way. And basically, it's like, um, let's just pretend if you're somebody and you're you're tracking your body weight and you only track it once a week and you have you have an inaccurate weigh-in, right? And let's just say your weight fluctuates for any reason. And I've talked about this before as well. Like you can, that weigh-in went, let's say you're up two or three pounds, whatever it is. And that person's like, oh, fuck that. I'm going to go and eat all around me all weekend, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the obstacle is the way the book is all about kind of shifting your perspective in terms of looking at that from a point where, right, something's gone wrong or there's a fluctuation in the scales or, you know, X, Y, or Z, what can I do to move forward from this? rather than kind of fall into the victim mindset and kind of playing to that. So, yeah, I think that's what you're getting at there as well, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, a lot of people have this all or nothing mentality. You know, people look at things too short term and they look at it it, as if it's if it's not 100 percent perfect, it's 100 percent imperfect. In actual fact, you know, the greatest success comes with more of a kind of a an 80 percent mentality. And what I mean by that is that if you are 100 percent you know, if you're 100% on it 100% of the time, you're destined for fail- failure because you can't be perfect all the time. But what happens is because you're trying to be perfect, you go to extremes to do it, and then you end up going backwards. Whereas if you understand that, you know, at the end of the day, your your diet doesn't need to be 100% perfect, just 80% of it, and there needs to be basic fundamentals there, you'll get a great result because you'll be more consistent with it. When it comes to business, it's not about getting it all right first time. It's learning from your mistakes and then adapting and then adjusting and then progressing. A lot of these things are about testing and adjusting, making mistakes, but then keeping consistent with it. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong is that they try and, you know, they try and be perfect with it. They're not perfect with it. And then they stop dead in their tracks. Definitely. And Okay, so yeah, we've talked a bit about the lessons from the army and momentum and the 80% mentality. I think it's going to lead us nicely into the the question I wanted to start off the podcast with, Jamie. And that was, yeah, I think it's going to create a bit more context around this stuff too. Okay, so you have a massively successful podcast, Mindset with Muscle, and your recent book as well, Mindset with Muscle. Um, what is that podcast slash the book like what is all what is that all about why would i want to pick up that book so i want to take you back to i think 2013 so 2013 was a huge mindset shift for myself um my wife got pregnant um i just competed in 2012 and won my pro card and I had a very different mentality to the one that I developed in 2013. My whole self-worth was focused on my physique. And, you know, that comes with a lot of flaws because if your physique isn't, you know, what you view as perfect or photo shoot condition, you feel like your whole life is flawed and that you're not down the path that you're at. And a lot of the things, you know, a lot of problems that I had from sort of the first two years of competing was that, that's all I thought I had to give to the world, a physique. I had nothing more to give. Now, what happened is obviously my wife got pregnant in 2013 and I sort of took my foot off the gas when it came to physique. Um, I was focusing more on my clients, but less on myself because I was more inter- you know, I was more focused on my wife and, you know, my soon to be born daughter. Now, what happened was I spent a lot of time listening instead of talking. I spent a lot of time listening to podcasts. Um, I also spent a lot of time reading books and I also spent a lot of time with my clients and helping them achieve their goals. What happened in 2013 was that I understood a totally new way of looking at things 
And not just that, my business doubled because I was focusing less on my own needs and more on other people's. And it's sort of like, you know, it was that kind of pinnacle moment where I started to understand the real reasons why people become successful. But not just that, I'd spent an entire year listening to these successful people who were solidifying exactly what I was coming to realize in that year. Um, I also decided to get pregnant with my with my wife and put on 55 pounds. And um, if anyone has seen uh, my six month transformation on um, on YouTube, that was when in 2014 I'd said, right, OK, now it's time to get back to shredded, back into my habits and routines and compete at the world championships. And I lost the 55 pounds, got in the shape of my life. And ever since that show, I've maintained a very good physique. And a lot of it has come down to mindset. And that was my kind of understanding with a lot of things. And that is why I decided to delve more into the mindset because there is so many different nutrition and training protocols and principles. However, they all tend to come to the same resolution provided the same fundamentals are in place. And what I mean by that is that there's lots of different ways of dieting, but the fundamental of weight loss is a calorie deficit. So as long as each diet equates to the fundamental of calorie deficit, it will, in inverted commas, work. Because to me, what will work is something that is sustainable, i.e. it won't just get the result, it will keep the result. But this is the same with a lot of things. And it made me kind of think, well, hang on a minute, you know, social media changes all the time, nutrition principles and making things easy changes all the time. Yet these books that I'm reading um, on mindset, some of the greatest books that I've ever read are about 70, 80 years old, yet they're still just as relevant today as they have ever been. Some of the most amazing books that I'm reading at the moment are by Aristotle, and that's over 2,000 years old, yet the information that's there is still relevant today which kind of gave me a bit of a wake-up call to realize that if you can understand what's going on in that noggin of yours and you can master it, it's not going to change or go anywhere because it hasn't changed in 2,000 years and it's not going to change now. So for myself, it was like, right, this is what people need. Stop focusing on very little things such as should I have 200 grams of protein or 220 and and focus on more you know, life changing things such as habits, routines, understanding self awareness, understanding self confidence, understanding cognitive biases, defense mechanisms, coping mechanisms, all of these things which people need to know, which are potentially stopping them from achieving success. And that's where I sort of um, delved down a lot in 2013, 2014. And I came to the conclusion where you know, I kind of know what I'm doing with this stuff now. I've adapted a lot of it. A lot of people are listening to what I'm saying and I want to, you know, create a podcast based on this because there was nothing like it in the fitness industry. Every single podcast I was listening to in the fitness industry, I was switching off because it was just like, it was just nutrition and training. No one was addressing mindset, which is obviously where my podcast came in. We've, you know, it's been running 73 weeks now and um and yeah i mean kind of the rest is history i'd really focused on obviously doing the podcast and then the reason for the podcast was because of the amount of podcasts i listened to but then the reason for the book was because of the amount of books that i'd read so it was only natural or it felt natural for me to do one of my own and obviously that was where the idea of mindset and muscle podcast came and obviously that was where the idea for the mindset and muscle book came and from that mindset and muscle book, Jamie, um, like for somebody who is that hasn't even heard about this, where obviously there's probably a logical flow for them in the book to kind of go from where they are now to getting results in their life, wherever it may be. But um, yeah, you've talked, you've already kind of mentioned it, like habits, routine, self awareness, self confidence. Is that kind of where you start? Do you start with changing small little habits, changing small little routines, and then building from there, or? Do you say, right, we're going to write down this specific goal and work from there? Or what way would you do it? So the book starts really with problems and solutions. The first chapter is getting you to understand that, you know, problems are part of life. And what I mean by that is that we all have problems. You know, the reason that we are motivated to do things 
are because of problems. You know, if your problem is that you need to pay bills, you need, you know, that's why you have a job. If your problem is that you need to go to the gym, I said, you know, you see where I'm coming at there. We, we, we need problems to resolve in order to be motivated to do things. So what I get to do in the first chapter with people is first and foremost, to be honest with themselves, address their problems. So what I say to a lot of people is that I have a lot of clients come to me and say, I need to lose 10 pounds or I need to lose 20 pounds. But that's the wrong question. The question is, why are you 20 pounds overweight in the first place? Because if you don't address the problem there, you'll look for a solution. You might get a result, but you haven't addressed the problem. So a lot of the chat, first chapter is getting you to be more self-aware, getting you to understand your problems, and then understanding uh, habits and routines to change it. So it's more of a kind of set some reps for the brain. What I'm trying to get you to do is exercise your brain, get you to understand your problems, and then take you through chapter by chapter different different things that you can adopt to slowly change those bad habits, create new habits, and have obviously what most people are looking for is is success, and not just in the body, um, in your business and in your brain too. And in terms of those habits and routines, Jamie, I think I had a question roughly that I laid out, probably going to bring it in later, but it's going to tie in nicely now. Like if you're looking at the everyday person, somebody who works crazy hours throughout the week, they, they fool themselves into thinking I don't have the time to get in shape or I'm too busy with the kids or whatever it is. Like if you're trying to give small little habit and routine, we'll say tactics, tips, changes for them to implement, like what would be the must do's for them to start with, you could say roughly, if you were to give like just simple here, do this, do this, do this, or focus on this? So a lot of people need to understand the difference between uh, process-based goals and outcome-based goals. Most people, most people's outcome is a, a certain number on the scale or a certain amount of weight loss. But the trouble with having an outcome-based goal and not focusing on the processes to get there is you, if you do get there, you usually go to extremes to achieve the result. And once you get it, you didn't know how you got it because you went to so many extremes to to get it and the thing is is that this is most people when they're looking for a quick fix with their weight loss etc etc you know they haven't developed any habits or routines because they haven't enjoyed the things that they have done in order to get there so as soon as they do get there they're not going to keep continuing with it because they hated what they did to get there so what I get people to do is get out of looking at more outcome-based goals and look at process-based goals and what I mean by process-based goals is I get people to look at three things that they can do on a daily basis which will contribute to their overall goal so rather than say to yourself i need to lose 20 pounds say to yourself what three things can i do today in order to get in shape well there's three things which i'd recommend hit 10,000 steps per day drink two to three liters of water and make more conscious eating decisions. Now, that sounds very easy to do. And the thing is, it is. If you are more conscious about your steps, you're more conscious about moving. So just you being more conscious about moving more and exercising more and actually having a kind of measurement of progress will enable you to possibly eat less, possibly focus more on actually becoming more active and, and get more results. Most people I know do not drink enough, so being able to hydrate yourself gives you more energy, um, actually helps with weight loss, and it's a very easy thing to focus on. And the final one is make more conscious eating decisions. We are very, very automatic when it comes to eating. You know, we adopt certain good habits, bad habits, but as soon as you make a conscious decision about the things that you're consuming, that in itself can highlight where your weaknesses are. If you're consciously now aware that you are eating a couple of bars of chocolate extra a day and you don't eat a couple of bars of extra chocolate a day, that calorie deficit in itself for the week would be enough to drop one to two pounds. And all you have done is just become more aware. So you can see three very, very simple processes actually contribute very much so to an outcome-based goal. And what's surprising is six to seven weeks later, if you achieve your goal, you're going to be more consistent with keeping it because it's very easy to keep those enjoyable processes. 
because you have now created what's called a habit loop, which means that you your cues and your reactions, i.e. drinking water, being more active and making conscious you know, eating decisions, will suddenly see a reward from doing. And any habit, good or bad, the reason that you are consistent with it is because you get a reward from it. No, I love that because it's actually something that I've been pushing a lot lately too. Um, even putting out like general pieces of content, basic stuff, like telling people, look guys, parking further away, taking this stairs, doing the basic stuff we all know, Jamie. Um, the more water is massive because of the knock-on effects, like you said, and then the conscious eating decisions. It's, 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 I'm delighted now you've actually said those three exact things because I've been pushing it a lot lately. Um, just kind of coming back to the basics as well because people forget about... Or people kind of, you know, they want the quick fix, they want the magic bullet, they want they want shit now, as I always say. Um, no, I love that, Jamie, so thanks for clarifying that as well, because I think people that have been listening to me saying the last few weeks, they might um, cement it a bit more in their head by listening to this podcast too. But then, the question I have then for that, Jamie, though, as well, is how can Jamie eat Skittles for breakfast every fucking morning and still be shredded? <laughs> well, it's, it's, not, it's not Skittles, it's peanut M&M's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got that one wrong. It's the Grey, the Grey Goose and Skittles comes in somewhere. We'll get, we'll get to that in a minute. But um, yeah, I suppose to any of the questions that I've been asking my audience, like what do they want answered or ask Jamie, um, even though me and you, we both know how to do it, we'd say, in quotes. Um, but I suppose just for someone listening to notes it in, how can you have peanut M&Ms in your bowl of porridge every morning and still be possibly in the best shape of your life 24-7? Okay, so what I would say to a lot of people is it's because I eat peanut M&Ms every breakfast that I am in the shape of my life. Now, that sounds like, what on earth is Jamie talking about? You've got to start, you've got to understand what's called, and I don't want to get, I hate getting science, but you've got to understand the law of thermodynamics. At the end of the day, I, if I eat less than I burn, I will lose weight. So what I'm saying from an extreme point of view to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that as long as I maintain a calorie deficit every single day, I will lose weight. So let's take this to the extreme. If I only went to the shop and bought a kilogram bag of peanut M&Ms and ate it every single day and I ate nothing more than peanut M&Ms, provided I am in a calorie deficit, I will lose weight. Now, I'm going to delve a little bit deeper and tell you why that would be a stupid idea to do. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we don't want to lose weight. We want to drop body fat, we want to build muscle, and we want to focus not only on macronutrients, which is protein, fats, and carbs, and making sure those ratios are adequate, we also need to focus on our health. So although I could sustain energy and lose weight and possibly live off M&Ms for a small period of time, my health would potentially get affected because I'm not hitting all of my essential micronutrients. I'm probably not getting all my fiber in. Um, I'm not getting adequate protein levels for muscle maintenance, etc., etc., etc. So what I'm actually saying is that you've got to understand once you know that a calorie deficit is the main fundamental of weight loss, you then go up the ladder of understanding macronutrients. Macronutrients are protein, fats, and carbs, and you have to have adequate amounts of them in order to, you know, change your body composition, change your body composition, build muscle, lose body fat, etc., etc. I'm aware that my maintenance amount of calories per day to consume, um, provided that I hit that number. I'll be either dropping a pound a week or maintaining my weight is around 3,400 calories. So a handful or about 55 grams of peanut M&Ms is about 220 calories. That isn't a lot of calories when compared to the fact that I can maintain my weight at 3,400 calories. So in actual fact, I can get away with eating that because a it more or less, you know, is redundant compared to everything else I'm eating. B, everything else I'm eating during the day is good quality protein, carbs, and fat sources. And C, I like peanut M&M's. So if I've got it in my diet every day, 
I'm going to keep consistent with it, provided it hits those certain fundamentals. Kind of rabbit hole down a little bit, but what I want to try and get people out of is the mindset of, can I eat that? Can't I eat that? Because the answer to any fitness rela- related question is, it depends. If you are five foot two, 120 pound female who is maintaining her, her body weight at 1400 calories, and you turn around to me and go, can I have 55 grams of peanut M&Ms? There'll be two things I will say. Yes, you can. But that is not a very good use of calories because essentially that is a third of your calorie intake and you're going to be pretty hungry. Or B, no, you can't because, same again, it's a stupid thing for you to put into your diet when there's, you know, you don't have many calories and your main focus would be on food volume. So the answer to the question is, can you eat M&Ms and get in the shape of your life? And the answer to that question is, well, it depends. It depends on how many calories you can consume on a daily basis. It depends on if you like peanut M&Ms. And it depends if you understand exactly what it is that is going into your body. If you understand how many calories, fats, proteins, and carbs, and you factored it in, it's a great idea. If you're a person that doesn't want to track macronutrients and wants to lose weight and is going down the whole intuitive eating, making conscious eating decisions, it might be the right thing to do and it might not it all depends if you get success with it so this is always the most confusing thing when it comes to nutrition and training because everything is you know in context with so many variables which is why you can't give someone an absolute answer but what i one thing i would say to you is look you know if you want to have peanut m&ms have it you know just make sure that that's not going to cause you to gain weight because it's not being measured, not being managed, and you're not maintaining a calorie deficit. Yeah, that's brilliant, Jamie, because in episode three, I think it was, we went through um, all the principal side of things with Danny Lennon. So if anybody is confused and what Jamie touched on, could just go back and listen to that episode because that covers all that. But Jamie's after creating a massive amount of context there for that, which is brilliant because, yeah, a lot of it does depend. And like Jamie just said, 3,400 calories just to maintain your weight is a lot of food. And again, just take that into context and realize it. And if you're following him, if you start following him or you are already following him on Instagram and stuff, just just remember that when you see those posts go up as well. Um, but it, it's the same thing with the mindset, Jamie. The principles are there. They're, they're probably not going to change. They're, they're grounded in science now. So, yeah, that's that's kind of the flexibility side of the training and nutrition side of things. Um, but, yeah, like what is your views on... Just while we're on it, Jamie, what is your views on flexibility? Like, do you have, do you say, right, guys, 80, 20%, that's kind of what we roughly give a guideline for. Um, do you focus on days where they might have, quote unquote, free meals or that, that kind of stuff? Like, how, how flexible um, do you give people guidelines for? I think it all depends on their past and their journey. And what I mean by that is that some people don't work well with flexible dieting because when you give people too much choice, as in they can pick whatever they like to eat, provided that they hit their target macros, they end up messing it up big time because they can't, they can't, they've yet to master the art of moderation, which most people can't. They can't just have a handful of M&Ms. They have to go and have a whole, you know, two or three packets. They can't just have um, a chocolate bar. They have to go and have three. So they need to address certain things first. Um, A lot of things that you're dealing with when it comes to nutrition is belief patterns. And the first thing that I try and get people to build up is their own confidence with their own decision making. But understand that there is no wizardry to this. It comes down to adherence. It comes down to consistency. So a meal plan to a lot of people can be a fantastic thing. The reason that it can be fantastic is if you do have a female, let's just say, who is on 1,400 calories and you gave her a flexible approach and then she's on Instagram seeing that everyone's eating Skittles and peanut M&Ms like Jamie is and still being shredded, she might think, well, if he can do it, I can do it too. And if we sort of backtrack to um, what I was talking about with you know context of whether you can or you can't, a lot of people do not understand that. You know, it's very unfortunate to be a 120 pound female, yet potentially have the same appetite as me. 
you know, that is very, very unlucky and I'm very, <laughs> <laughs> very grateful that I have the calories that I have. But what I'm trying to get at is if you have a meal plan, you can really factor in maximal amounts of food volume. I can, put, you know, I can get a female client on a meal plan on 1400 calories and she is, cr- no, say not crying to me, but she's whinging to me that she can't eat all that food. Yet if I possibly gave her her target macros and told her to do it herself, she might be chewing her arm off. And it's purely because that I understand certain foods which are more satisfying, certain foods which have more volume in, and her habits and routines, which means that if she did follow that, and it is enjoyable because I know the the food that she likes and they're the times in which she eats, that she will get an immense amount of success in a short period of time, then that would be the right way forward. But that wouldn't be the ultimate answer to her problems. That might be just getting her to understand where she's going wrong, what I suggest and how I would do it. Therefore, being able to go, ah, okay, this is how Jamie would do it. This is the fundamentals of the meal plan. So once I've had a result, I've built up that self-confidence with knowing that I can adhere to a plan of action. And now I can start to look at foods differently so I can sort of create my own. And that's ideally where I want to get every client, understanding what it is that they're going wrong with, understanding what they need to do to go right, and understanding that, you know, you're going to have different periods in your life where you're going to be, you know, hitting the diet and training a bit harder and then taking your foot off the pedal because there is no end point in this. There is no, you know, game complete. It's always in a constant state of change and growth. You've just got to understand that if you, you know, have get a little bit fluffier for a couple of months, there's nothing wrong with that. And getting ridiculously shredded to a certain extent, um, there's nothing wrong with that either. It all depends on your goals. You know, at the moment I'm doing a V blog called the Shred, and you know, the reason for that is just for right. You know, I just want to up my game a little bit, focus on a little bit more habits and routines but not just that show people that you can get in photo shoot condition without necessarily having to you know track every single gram that goes in your gob yeah and i've been i've been following that myself actually jamie too because i i'm not sure if you've heard of hurling over here in ireland gaa sport um but i i'm in the middle of that now um and basically like i'm trying to juggle performance and body comp as, as best i can so a few weeks back just after the the new year i said right i'm just gonna bring down the body fat a small bit and i just i just simply i ate having protein targets mainly and then everything else was just kind of how i was feeling that day and i dropped nearly 10 pounds easy and that is exactly i think what you're doing right now you're not you're not finding things hard at all and that's that's probably because of what you the years of the habits routines and the mindset you've built up um and yeah correct me if i'm wrong Yep. So a lot of people have turned around to me and say, yeah, but what you're doing, Jamie, not everyone could do. And I say, I completely agree because a lot of people look at food very differently to the way that I look at it. And it's because I've spent so many years doing this. You know, I I gave an example um, about a year ago where I got out of King's Cross Station in London. I looked to my left and there was a Marks and Spencer's. I went in there and had one of the high protein flat, you know, flatbreads. Uh, I think I bought like a, a greens drink and um, one of those light popcorns. And I sat down on the station and everyone to the left and right of me had McDonald's. First and foremost, I was annoyed because I didn't see it. <laughs> um, but secondly, I was just like, yeah, I didn't see that. But then when I looked, I saw those golden arches and I was like, my brain has just been conditioned to look for things like m and and you know and healthier options however most people's brains aren't conditioned for that when you naturally go to places like fast food and mcdonald's it's those marketing those yellow you know the uh what they're called mcdonald's call them now um the the golden arches that's the one people are yeah you know, people are more focused on those things and it becomes a lot more difficult when you highlight you know things that are can potentially have an adverse effect on your health you know, a lot, I do spend a lot of time in McDonald's, but I'm not sitting there having Big Mac, Big Mac and fries. I'm having a grilled chicken wrap. So, you know, it's all these little things which contribute to my success. You know, I tend to like healthy food. You know, I like my vegetables. I like good sources of protein. You know, I don't tend to gravitate towards crap food. I enjoy cooking. 
you know, I enjoy making healthy meals and recipes. I'm passionate about food. And also I, you know, I am one scatty person. You know, I, my, my neat score, my non-exercise activity thermogenesis is through the roof because I'm up at quarter to five in the morning and, you know, half 11 at night, I'm still going. So that in itself, you know, my activity levels are through the roof. So there's, there's so many different factors in my life which make my life easier, but then it comes more down to my habits and routines. But it's also that I have more good habits than I do bad, so they kind of outweigh it. You know, I do like my vodka and everything else, et cetera, et cetera, but it's all done to the part, you know, to the most of it in moderation. And I am a very active person who's very conscious about the foods that he eats, so it kind of outweighs it. Yeah, yeah. And I think as well, <clears throat> the flexibility is there too. Like, if you did want to have, you know, a night out, a social event, fa- family and friends, you could do the dog on it to an extent and you know, still be perfectly fine to be on track the following days from it. Like, so, yeah, no, that's. I love the fact that you brought up there, though, Jamie, about um, it's not in people's like focus or awareness, the Marks and Spencers versus McDonald's. That never really thought of it that way. Like, that's. I yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people aren't aware of your reticular activating system, and I'll give you a bit of context with that. If if you if you have a if you have a car which you're looking to buy, let's just say you're looking to buy a, a mini or something, yeah, you know, probably a little bit nicer than a mini. Uh, but what you'll see is that you'll see that car everywhere, and you're like, everyone's got that car. But the thing is, is they they haven't. It's just because you're focused on it, you're more aware of other people having it. Uh, an example as well for some of your listeners out there, if, if you've ever had been pregnant or had your wife pregnant before, you start seeing pregnant people everywhere, literally everywhere. And the reality is, is that there, there's not any more. You're just more aware of people who are pregnant because it's currently happening to you. And this is exactly the same with with your nutrition, with with everything. If you're, you know, if you're an avid McDonald's goer and you see one, you'll get a little bit excited and you'll be more aware of them that are around so think about that you know think about these things that you see on a daily basis and potentially look at changing them you know there's very simple processes that you can do to change your habits i know a lot of people in london that walk past certain places which their habits and routines means that they get up they go to that place they have breakfast it might not be the healthiest of breakfast but just changing their walk on a daily basis gets it out of their head you know, there's so many different things that you can do with your habits and routines once you know that that can potentially be um, a downside to what it is that you're doing. Yeah, definitely, because the I don't get into too much detail with the, the like the science behind like goal setting stuff and mindset stuff with our members here because we just want to get them on the kind of the proper track with staying focused on the process oriented goals you're talking about and one example i used to always use jamie i still use it to this day is recently like over the last year i bought an estate model car and i remember my parents were saying to me that just they, they never they never really see those cars around the place but just because i bought the car then i kept getting text messages every second day oh my god david i'm seeing your car everywhere now and again that's just because it was, it was brought into their focus and i think as well when i decided last year to uh propose to my partner was um the whole idea with getting the engagement ring ready and to me like i would have i wouldn't have a clue about rings or anything like that but then all of a sudden when i was in the process of getting ready they were fucking everywhere like every ad i looked at at instagram they were popping up everywhere in went town you know you, you just see things ever because they're in more of your focus so thanks for touching on that jamie as well yeah, you're welcome um no jamie i know i kind of probably i'm backtracking a bit but i i really wanted to ask you this because it's something that was probably personal and close to your heart as well was the the 24 hour peggy push um that was that was incredible and i was i followed that all the way and i'm sure a lot of people have as well or if people haven't heard about it i think yeah i just want to ask you maybe just explain what you did and i suppose like why did you do the peggy push so when i'd opened my gym facility i always wanted to do a charity event uh, there's a local charity called St. Wilfred's Hospice and basically they look after um, elderly people before they pass away. And my granddad was actually with them um, about five, six years, about six years ago before he passed away. And I was so amazed at the job that they had done, but also aware of how much funding that they need to keep the place open. So I always said that once I had my gym facility, I'd want to you know, sort of give back to them. 
And one of our most brutal pieces of equipment in our gym facility is what we call Peggy. And it's a, a very heavy weighted sled and it absolutely destroys all of our clients. So I had a bit of an idea um, that me and my team were going to push her for 24 hours. We decided to go for an eight man team and we were going to do two hours each two you know, two hours on. Um, and we're going to do sort of four hours each in total um, and ro- rotate through. Now, I, I'm very good friends with a guy called Ross Edgley. And Ross does all these crazy things for charity, a lot of 24-hour events. He uh, pulled a mini for a marathon. He did a 24-hour rope climb and climbed the height of Everest. He did a triathlon. So it was a fifth, I think it was a 100-pound tree. He ran, swim and, ran, swam, and cycled ridiculous amounts for it. Um, beginning of this year, he ran 30 marathons in 30 days on the treadmill in his living room. Bit of a crazy person. And after speaking to him, I was just like, actually, I'll, I think I'm going to do this myself. And everyone kind of looked at me and was like, what? I said, no, no, don't worry. I said, I'm going to push it myself. And they're like, you're going to push a 140 kilo sled for 24 hours by yourself. And I was like, yeah. And it was this, this kind of like kind of fear of and doubt of other people that excited me to say, well, I'll show you. And this was sort of five weeks before I was doing the event. So I was like, right, I've got some work on my hand. I've got to now kind of adapt my body to being able to push this sled for 24 hours. You know, I'm not known for my endurance events, even though that, you know, I'm very focused on mindset with things like that. And I think that's the most important thing when it comes to anything like that is it's not necessarily um, fitness. It's more of, you know, what's going on in your head during that time. So I spent uh, eight weeks uh, tr- sorry, I spent five weeks training for it, and then I actually looked on the Guinness World Record site, and I actually found that there was a Guinness World Record for it. Um, it was 24 kilometers, and it was by a four-man team. And what they had done is they'd done a, a kilometer an hour, rotated through for 24 hours. So not only did I have you know, the goal of raising as much money for charity, I had a goal of beating a four-man team. And uh, I think it was... Mid-November, I started at 6 p.m. on Saturday. No, sorry, 6 p.m. on Friday, finished at 6 p.m. Saturday, uh, pushed the sled for 24 hours, uh, beat the four-man world record. I did 25.7 kilometers, and I raised, I think, in total over £12,000 for St. Wilfred's Hospice. So it's a very kind of emotional um, time for me, that was, and something that really kind of changed something in me as well by just – kind of proving to people everything that I talk about with regards to mindset working and the fact that I'd found something beyond competing, uh, jumping on stage that I could push myself in. Yeah. I think, yeah, even looking from my perspective, like it was like, like it was like an accumulation of, you know, open the gym, the podcast, the book, and then you did this. It was, it was nice to see it like, because so many people are just full of shit, like, and just talking about X, Y, or Z and never actually following through on things. Um, and you know yourself the amount of people that have podcasts the amount of people that have books in the fitness world and that they barely even train themselves it's just like oh come on um so it, you know, it, was, it was lovely to see that jamie and i suppose one thing i want to ask you from that is i don't know if you've even thought about it until now but what would you say was the biggest lesson you took from that 24 hour peggy push i think the biggest um i think i think the most important thing that i would say to people is is just believe that you can do something and you can do anything and it sounds a little bit cliche but it but what what drove me to continue that was that i'd already said i'd already won i'd already pushed it to, for 24 hours and broken the world record before i'd even started because there was no doubt self doubt or anything in my mind that i wasn't going to do it it was just a case of just just keep pushing and I think that's a huge analogy for life, really. You know, at the end of the day, you're always going to have, you know, you're always going to be tired. You're always going to have problems. But as long as you keep pushing forward, um, you can achieve great things. The thing that's stopping you doing that is believing that you can. Cool. And would you say, like, would you say that's the biggest lesson from opening Grenade Fit as well? Yeah, I, I think... I say this all the time, you know, a lot of people, the reason that I let so many people into my life, you know, into my personal life, into what it is that I do is I try and show people that, 
you know, I'm not doing anything special. I'm not doing anything magical. I'm not better than anybody else or more talented than anyone else. You know, I scraped my GCSEs, literally scraped my GCSEs. I only got one year of my two year, um, college, uh, certificate because I spent more time drinking than I did actually in education. And, you know, I'm no different to anybody else. And if anything that I've proven with the book, with the, you know, with the gym and what it is, what I do is that I don't need permission from anyone to do anything and neither do you. If there's something in life that you want to do, stop waiting because no one is going to turn around and go, yep, now is the time to do it. Your complete control of that is in, in you now. So if there is something that you're umming and ahhing about and you're waiting for, don't. Because there's going to be a time in your life where you're going to go, I wish I'd done that. And that time will be probably on your deathbed when it's too late. Powerful stuff, powerful stuff. No, I, I always actually round off the podcast, Jamie, by asking about the um, your biggest lesson from 2016. But I think we've, we've definitely covered it there on that anyway. Um, and one thing that I actually forgot... Uh, at the start, I, I've kind of I've told myself I want to ask this to every guest. It's more of a challenge for the guest more than me, or anything like that. But um, it's bear in mind this sh- I should have asked this at the start, Jamie. But if you were to explain in ten seconds or less what you actually do, what would you say? What I actually do. Wake up every day, loving. Teaching people that they can do whatever the fuck they want to do with their lives. Nice. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. That was the quickest one we've had yet, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you stumped me for a second now. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Hmm. No, that's hmm. good because it's it's one thing that I read in a book a few years back and it really challenged me as well to be like, hmm, well, how could I answer that? Like, because if you're if you're passing someone at an event or something like that, and you can tell them like rapid fast on the spot what you do, it's nice to have it in your arsenal as well. Um. Yeah, and I think it, I think it's important for people. Like literally now, if you if you are if you're listening to this podcast or you're going for a walk or you're in your car, just have a look around and and have a little bit of a tap in your pocket or look to the left. Do you have something called a mobile phone? That mobile phone, you can find out all of life life's answers you can learn how to build a website you can learn how to download a podcast you can learn how to create a podcast you can learn how to write a book you can learn how to open a gym when i first opened grenade fit the day that i said i was going to open a gym the first thing i did i googled how to open a gym okay everything that you need in your life is in your pocket the only difference is is most people don't absorb anything that is available to them listen to it learn apply and make sure that you're not going to have any regrets nice one and jamie just to round off um i think we've we've covered an immense amount i actually got through a lot more than we thought i would so thank you for that absolutely brilliant we've got some training stuff or got some nutritional stuff in there as well with tons of tons of mindset stuff um but yeah, I think for anybody that follows you, you'll know that you have some daft uh, Snapchat stories up with throwing darts and throwing stuff into blenders. How in God's name do you do it? Practice. Simple as that. You know, it all started with a bit of a joke. Um, and then when you do it for so long, you get pretty good at it. And then you always push the boat out to, to try and better your last one. And I've been actually doing my throwing tricks for a year now. So if you think if you're doing something every day for a year and practicing it, you you get pretty good. And, you know, I've um, so many people say, oh, just throw that. And most of the time I I do. I I had a a funny situation in uh, in China or a nightclub and someone like recognized me. They gave me something, said, chuck that. And I threw it straight into a shot glass on the uh, on the uh, other side of the bar. And they were just like, whoa. (laughs) And actual fact, I was like, whoa, I can't believe I did that. (laughs) But it just comes out of practice. And for me and social media, it's about, um, I think it's edutainment. You know, it's understanding that I don't take myself too seriously. I love the fact that I can wake up every day and do the thing that I want to do. And the fact that just doing these things makes people's, you know, makes people smile, makes their day a little bit better. It's not all, it's not all training and nutrition and stuff either. Like. <laughs> no, exactly. Um, Jamie, probably another one tough, a tough one for you. 
you're probably you're incredible at throwing things you're incredible at getting people into insane shape um but what are you not very good at delegation um getting other people to do stuff for me um that is a huge issue uh for me and uh switching off um switching off my phone switching off my you know trying to be everywhere all of the time you know because i love what i do so much i don't look at it as a job but the people around me do so sometimes it's understanding that and actually and saying to myself now that i'm a, i'm in a position where i can take a day off i just sometimes need to take my own advice with that mm, the, i think i'm in the same boat as you on that one too <laughs> yeah and last one i promise uh, i i really wanted to ask you this one um okay so basically you have only one alcohol choice left for the rest of your life you can only drink one type of alcohol and you can only have one type of sweet or chocolate whatever you want to say so you have two options it's going to be grey goose and skittles or hendrix gin and peanut m&ms which would it be i'm going to go hendrix and peanut m&ms oh. again i i really i really am cuz uh yeah it's not that i've gone off skittles i just i love my peanut m&ms and i do love and i do love my gin and i i tell you what a as much as a grey goose is nice a, a nice hendrix with a side order of skill, uh, skills, side order of peanut M and M sounds pretty damn good. <laughs> brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff, Jamie. Um, I'm going to put all the show notes and stuff and links to the book, the website, everything in the show notes page. And um, yeah, if you've anything else now you want to leave the listeners with, now is the time. Uh, if anyone wants to follow my socials, it's very easy to find me. Um, if you just go to Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter and just put at Grenade J, um, I'll come up. Um, do check out my website, www.grenade-fit.com, and my book is available on Amazon. Just type in Mindset with Muscle. As same with my podcast too. If you go onto iTunes, type in Mindset with Muscle. We've got 73... 63 or 73 I'm trying to remember uh, very game changing episodes there yeah brilliant and I, that comes highly recommended for myself as well guys and like I said I'll put all those links anyway in the show notes page it'll be um, docfitnessonline forward slash episode 5 and Jamie I just want to say thank you very very much for coming on I really appreciate your time and hopefully the guests have taken as much away from that as I have same thank you ever so much for having me on So lastly, guys, just a big thank you again for tuning in to episode five. And if you go over to Doc Fitness Online forward slash episode five, you will get the links to Jamie's social channels and his podcast, his book over there as well, which again comes highly recommended from myself. Now for episode six, I have Mr. Phil Graham on the podcast, who has some massive lessons behind living with type one diabetes and as well some brilliant takeaways in terms of everything muscle building and just a whole host of lessons in there because one thing i'm trying to do even just after the first four episodes of this podcast is i want to have a bit more of a conversational flow in them i don't want them to be too rigid or structured with rigid questions so even the questions i get off the audiences what i'm doing is i'm mainly asking they're the main questions i ask and then everything else is just a flow and kind of see what we can get from there because I don't know about you listening in, but whenever you hear of someone's lessons throughout their experiences, that's where the golden takeaways are, and you can learn the most from them. And they're just enjoyable to listen to as well. Nobody wants to be listening to rigid questions and with plain, rigid answers off a script. So again, I'm just trying to make the podcast flow a bit better. But saying that, keep the questions coming in because the last three episodes now, I have based all the podcasts around all the questions I've got and so over on the show notes page if you're not following me already on instagram that is probably the best place just to ask me or send me a snapchat send me an email if you want but instagram is the easiest because you can leave a comment under a certain photo whenever that pops into your head or you can leave a comment under this episode when it's up on instagram as well so again thank you for tuning in stay tuned for phil graham on next and we shall chat to you soon bye-bye